Well, I hope at least some of you are having as much fun as I am uh, journeying through the gospel according to Mark over the past several months. We are nearing the end of chapter 6, and in chapter after chapter, passage after passage, Mark is not only reporting history to us, but he is establishing his central thesis, the thing he wants us to understand most, which is found in chapter 1, verse 1, that his gospel is the beginning of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that it is good news for sinners. And we see this same theme appear in different angles and different passages and in a fresh way in our passage this morning. Now, our passage this morning is one of the most familiar stories in the Bible. It's one of those passages you might have seen and, th- and thought, well, man, I, I know everything that's here. Uh, I'm going to flip ahead to see what's next week. But the reality is the Lord has business to do with us this morning in this passage. It is no accident that we're here. It's no accident that we're going through Mark, journeying through his gospel at this pace, and that we come this morning, August 28th, 2022, to this particular story. So let's turn in our Bibles together to Mark chapter 6. Turn with me to Mark chapter 6. As you're making your way there, I'll go ahead and give you uh, what I think is kind of the big idea. A couple of sentences here that I think encapsulate the main thing that Mark is up to in this story, starting in verse 31. Here's what I think is the big idea. Two sentences. Jesus will always provide what you need and more. Jesus will always provide what you need and more. So trust him as you feast on his bounty and minister in his name. Jesus will always provide what you need and more. So trust him as you feast on his bounty and minister in his name as you feast on his bounty and minister in his name. We're going to think about this in three points, which follow the progression of this story. First, the shepherd. We'll see that in verses 31 to 34. Second, the crisis. That's verses 35 to 40. And third, the feast. That's verses 41 to 44. The shepherd, the crisis, the feast. First, the shepherd. Look there at verse 31. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Now, there's a lot of application that one could do, a preacher could do here, on the importance of rest. And I think that's valid, uh, but I don't think it's the main point that Mark is trying to get across in this particular passage. It it might be valid kind of by way of secondary or tertiary application, but I'm not going to belabor the point because I think Mark wants us to get to the actual scene of his story. But I will just say, and I will ask you to just notice that rest here is not a suggestion. Jesus is not really in the business of giving suggestions. This is a command. And notice that Jesus, in, in all of his humanity, yes, he is the eternal son of God, but he is also truly man. He does not exempt himself from this need to rest. He doesn't say, go away and find some rest. I can tell you disciples are really beleaguered. No, he says, come with me together. We need rest. We're going to go find rest. And as we enter the story, as we climb into this boat with them, Mark wants us to feel, to sense Jesus's and the disciples' exhaustion, their depletion after doing so much ministry. You remember where we left off last time was with verse 30. The disciples return to Jesus and recount to him all that they have accomplished in his name. So they're tired, and so is he. So they get in a boat, 
and they head off for a short sabbatical. Verse 33, but, it's never the word you want to hear when you're on your way to a sabbatical. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had a meltdown because he needed a break. No. This is, this is amazing because that, that's like the Matt Smethurst version. All right? That's what I that's how I would have responded in this situation. You realize what's happened. Jesus, they get in the boat in order to get away from the crowds, and the crowds see where they're going and run on foot around so that they can be there waiting when the disciples land on the distant shore. Imagine how exasperated you would feel. And yet, what we read instead is when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, He had compassion on them. That that, that was his default reaction. He had compassion on them. This word is only used, this word for compassion is only used in the New Testament with reference to Jesus Christ. And why does he feel this way? Well, Mark tells us, because the people were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus scans the shoreline And what he sees is a mass of lost, endangered, vulnerable, directionless, hungry, struggling sheep. Which is another way of saying shepherdless. Shepherdless sheep. I mean, if if sheep are famous for anything besides their their wool, it is their dim-wittedness, to put it mildly. They they are utterly dependent creatures who need constant supervision and provision in order to be kept fed and alive. So the picture here is not of this beautiful hillside dotted with little lammies. No, what Jesus sees on the hillside is a spiritual emergency. Because the leaders of these people The leaders of Israel have utterly failed the people of Israel over and over again, and it's been happening for centuries. This is a different generation, but it's the same old story. The scribes and Pharisees are not shepherding the souls of God's people. They're leading them astray. And therefore, the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus' opponents, they are in the bullseye of the Old Testament prophets' denunciations against God's so-called shepherds. I'll just show you the backdrop in one place. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34, this is one of the so-called major prophets in the Old Testament because it's a very long book. And in Ezekiel 34, Yahweh, the sovereign Lord, wants to have a word with the leaders of Israel who fancy themselves Good shepherds. And here's what he says. Ezekiel 34, starting in verse 8. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd and has been and so has been plundered and has become food for all the wild animals, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves. Rather than for my flock? Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. Now let your eyes fall down to verse 23. I will place over them one shepherd. 
my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. And one more place in the chapter I want you to see. Look down at verse 28. They will no longer be plundered by the nations, nor will wild animals devour them. They will live in safety, and no one will make them afraid. I will provide for them a land renowned for its crops, and they will no longer be victims of famine in the land or bear the scorn of the nations. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, the Israelites, are my people, declares the sovereign Lord. Verse 31, you are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, and I am your God declares the sovereign Lord. So turn back to Mark chapter 6. We're in verse 34. And in light of passages like Ezekiel 34, there are others, Jeremiah 23 and such. But in light of passages like Ezekiel 34, as we read Mark 6, 34, what should be ringing in our ears? Well, not just the indictment that we just heard, but also the promise. The promise that God himself is going to solve the dilemma his people have created. That God himself is going to be the solution to the problem. He is going to come and enter the scene and personally shepherd his people. And so in light of this, the grammar of verse 34, I know school doesn't start till tomorrow, kids, for many of you, but yes, the grammar is important here in understanding your Bible, and it here is fizzing with significance. Don't miss it. Look again, verse 34 of Mark 6, Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So what's the biggest problem according to Mark 34? There is no shepherd. There is no shepherd. There is no shepherd. What's the very next thing we read? So he, so he began to teach them many things. Not, so Jesus saw their predicament and resolved to go find a shepherd who could care for them. No, by entering the scene, Jesus is acting as the solution. He is Yahweh. He is the sovereign Lord of Ezekiel 34, who has finally, 2,000 years ago, on Middle Eastern soil, come to rescue and defend and feed and shepherd the people of God. And how interesting is it that as soon as Jesus looks upon them with compassion, literally the word there means he's moved to the bottom of his being, as soon as it happens, what does he immediately do? He feels compassion well up in his heart for these shepherdless sheep, and immediately it prompts him to teach. Not heal, not work wonders. Those things are obviously of value. Jesus spends plenty of time doing those things. But above all, his compassion drives him to open his mouth and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom of God. In other words, before Jesus gets to feeding the 5,000 and satisfying their stomachs, he gives them the bread that they most need. And this shouldn't surprise us, coming from the one, as we saw back in early March, the one who faced down Satan. Remember that showdown in the desert? He faced down Satan with the words, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The feeding of the 5,000 is an interesting miracle. I, I mentioned it's one of the most familiar. With the exception of the resurrection, the greatest miracle of all time, the resurrection of Jesus, the feeding of the 5,000 is actually the only miracle to appear in all four Gospels. There's something here that God, the divine author of Scripture, wants us to see and to internalize and to treasure. But though it appears in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only Mark, only Mark includes 
this little glimpse into the heart of Jesus. Only Mark includes this statement that Jesus saw the, the people on the hillside like sheep, as if they're sheep without a shepherd. And I have to wonder, like I try to remind you guys of every few weeks, remember the Gospel of Mark is the memoirs of Peter. Okay? Mark wasn't an eyewitness, but Peter, his close friend and associate, was. And so when we get these little vivid details, especially that are unique to Mark, I can just imagine him sitting there writing out the memories of Peter. Peter, the one who den- goes on to deny Jesus three times, but then what happens on a beach with the resurrected Christ? He's restored three times, and what does Jesus say to him? Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. It's that Peter who in all of his shame and failure encountered the good shepherd and was restored to ministry who is helping Mark and helping us see the heart of this shepherd as well. This, by the way, is why we place such a high premium here at RCBC. If we're doing things right, we will continue to place a high premium on the teaching and the preaching of God's word. It's not just because we like to hear ourselves talk. It's because we believe that the most important thing, the most valuable thing, the most useful thing that we have to offer to one another and to the city of Richmond and to the nations of the earth is God's voice, not ours. There is a place in church for topical sermons. If you stick around, you'll eventually hear me preach some sermons that are biblical in nature but are focused mainly on particular topics. But the main diet of our preaching, the main diet of the sermons here at RCBC is and will remain expositional. And that is intentional. Now, that word The the meaning of that word, expositional, can be heard just in the root of it, expose. Expositional preaching is when you open up the word of God and you expose God's word to God's people and God's people to God's word. It's like you just hold up a microphone as best you can to the mouth of God and let him speak. And a faithful preacher will not just read it and explain it, but will seek to apply it to the hearts of those who are gathered. That's what I, I labor to do every week. And that's not just because I found it on my job description. No, that's because we really believe here at RCBC that the way people are going to find spiritual life and grow in their faith is by attending to the word of God. It is his voice, not ours, that creates and nurtures and sustains spiritual life. The shepherd. Number two, the crisis. Verse 35, by this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. On the surface, this seems like a reasonable request. We don't have to be so super spiritual that we can't read this and not sympathize a little bit with the disciples. We'd probably say the same thing. I mean, they're probably thinking, come on, Jesus, like, we're supposed to be on a little sabbatical, and we did ministry today. Instead, fine, we haven't complained, but enough is enough, okay? We've been at it all day. Can we get back to the original plan Not to mention, this is looking more and more impractical by the minute because dusk is settling in, the people are hungry, and Jesus, did you notice there are thousands of them? (laughs) We love your teaching, Jesus, but there's always tomorrow. Like, can you land the plane? Can you finish your sermon so that we can get these people out to the town so that they can get their own dinners? Verse 37, but Jesus answered, You give them something to eat. I'm telling you, if you're a skeptic of the Bible, this just isn't the kind of character any human would make up. (laughs) He says things that are so utterly shocking and outlandish. 
and otherworldly. But I think the words of the gospel of Mark bear the fingerprints of authenticity. I think these words have the ring of authenticity because who would make this up? You give them something to eat. So they respond (laughs) with exasperation and I think sarcasm. That would take more than half a year's wages, Jesus. Are, Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? They're annoyed because they know that he knows they're broke. He's the one who told them back in verse 8, take nothing for your journey, no money in your belts. He impoverished them. He's the reason they're broke. He's the reason they can't afford to feed 50 people, much less 5,000. And so he can, and they're like, now he has the audacity to look at us with a straight face and say, all right, here's the plan. Here's the plan for this mega crowd. You cater dinner for all of them. I could just see them shaking their heads at one another. Like, what's wrong with this guy? What is wrong with him? He's just insulting our our intelligence. He He knows full well that we don't have what it takes. And it's at this point that I can Imagine a little smile creasing the lips of Jesus, a little twinkle in his eye as if to say, exactly. You don't have what it takes. That's why we're here. Your resources, he's saying, which were the first thing you looked to when I gave you this assignment. I told you to feed the crowds and you didn't immediately look to what I brought to the equation. You immediately looked to what you brought. Your resources are not sufficient and they never will be. See, I think he's saying to them, in all your calculations, you did a pretty good job. I mean, everything you've said is true. But in all your calculations, you forgot about one variable. You forgot to factor in one detail that changes the whole equation. And that's me. You have omnipotence available to you and he's standing in your midst. 500 years ago in his classic work, The Bondage of the Will, Martin Luther forcefully argued, I don't think he had uh, another way of arguing anything other than forcefully, He forcefully argued that that God's commands, track with me here, this is, this is a, we're going to have to put on a little bit of scuba gear in order to, this is not water skiing, this is theological scuba diving, so just stick with me, okay? He said, God's commands don't reveal our ability, they reveal our duty. In other words, just because God commands you to do something does not prove that you have the power in and of yourself to do it. He writes, quote, Some think that man is mocked by an impossible commandment, whereas I maintain that by this means man is admonished and awakened to see his own impotence. Commands do not prove the power of our will. Commands show us the extent of two things. God's commands show us the extent of our duty and our inability. In other words, in the Bible, a command does not presuppose the ability of the recipient, as I said, to fulfill it in his or her own power. You ought does not mean you can. You want to understand your Bible? Friend, if you want to understand this book, you have to understand this point. Realize that over and over again, from Genesis to Revelation, the incapable are commanded to do precisely the impossible so that the enabler, the one who enables, the one who empowers, would get all of the glory and so that we could get a whole lot of joy in the process. Our mission as a church, RCBC, to disciple the nations beginning right here in Richmond is laughably impossible. If we're the only ones in the equation. 
But just like the disciples on this ancient shoreside, we are not. When we think about our mission as a church, our responsibilities as a congregation both here and beyond, not to mention as individual Christians throughout the week, I wonder what happens to your imagination. When your imagination runs wild, everyone in this room has an imagination that is is prone to run wild. What does it run wild to? When your imagination gets going, does it tend to fixate on all you need to do, on all you can't do? That's That's what it does for me. I mean, when my imagination kind of escapes from the cage, as I think about the future, kids, church, family, finances, health. It it can be easy to just feel overcome with worry. You know, the problem in these moments is, is not actually my theology. It's that I haven't sufficiently formed and trained my imagination to serve that theology, to, to, to accord with that theology. But what if it did? What if it, it's so outlandish for fallen creatures, even you know, Christians to even imagine this, but what if your imagination ran wild with regard to the adequacy and sufficiency of God? Like what if that was your default? What if we were the kind of church where we experienced this counterculture within this family that our conversations with one another were flavored by a sense of expectation for how much God can provide. Not in a name it, claim it kind of way, but in a God is massive and he is generous. So we're going to ask big things of him and expect big things from him, as William Carey once said. And to get really practical with the application, brother and sister, if you want to be part of fostering this culture among us, of helping to facilitate a church culture in which our imaginations are running wild with thoughts of God's utter adequacy to meet all of our needs, then think about the fact. Don't forget that every time you talk with a fellow church member, it can can feel like an insignificant interaction, just just a passing encounter, but every time you encounter a fellow church member, your words carry power. They carry power. Your words can either dampen that person's trust in God's bigness and his provision, or they can widen that person's eyes to imagine, to anticipate all that he might be pleased to do. Verse 38. Back to the story. How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Go and see. So the disciples begrudgingly, I imagine, obey him, and so they start polling the crowd. Any of you got food? And, and the answer is basically no. I mean, they come, all they return with is, is an ancient Lunchable, all right? Five little barley loaves and two sardines. That's all they bring back, but it's the raw material. It's the raw material, that all that Jesus needs in order for him to work wonders, As I was studying this, I I thought about the fact that when we bring things to God, this is something you probably read about a lot in Christian books or hear preachers uh, hold forth about, you know, we often think about bringing to God our gifts and our talents. And that's right. God has given us, by the power of his Holy Spirit, specific gifts to honor him and serve the church and we should, and you, you are, if you're a believer in Christ, you are gifted by the Holy Spirit and should bring those to God. But I think one of the lessons of this story, especially in light of the really unimpressive Lunchable that they bring Jesus, is that it's not just the stuff that we feel we're great at that we should offer to him. It's also our weakness. I mean, yes, you should give to God out of your bounty, But it's quite another thing. It's quite another step of faith to bring to him your scarcity. Elizabeth Elliot once put it like this, quote, if the only thing you have to offer is a broken heart, you offer a broken heart. 
So in a time of grief, the recognition that this is material for sacrifice has been a very great strength to me. Realizing that nothing I have, nothing I am will be refused by Christ. I simply give it to him as the little boy gave Jesus his five loaves and two fishes with the same feeling of the disciples when they looked at it and said, what is the good of that for such a crowd? Naturally, in almost anything I offer to Christ, my reaction would be, what is the good of that? The point is, the use he makes of it is none of my business. The use he makes of it is none of my business but it is his blessing. The lunch wasn't impressive, but it was enough for the Son of God to work with. And again, this is why we need one another, one another's help to fire our imaginations because it's easy to believe when you can see the banquet. It's easy to sit on the grassy hillside and sit in expectation when the banquet is fully prepared. It's kind of more difficult when you, to sit in expectation when all you can see is five loaves and two fish. Verse 39, then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. It's easy to skim past these details to get to the the real action, right? To get to the performance of the miracle. But I want you to notice a couple things. Verse 39 and 40. First, Mark notes that they were seated in groups of hundreds and fifties. This is not accidental. This is almost certainly meant to evoke the way that Moses sat and divvied up the people of Israel in Exodus chapter 18 when they were in the wilderness, We, in Mark 6, are in a wilderness place. Your translation may say this is a deserted place or a solitary place. It means a desert place. This is a reenactment of the history of Israel as a new and greater Moses is ordering them to sit in these groups. And second, Mark also goes out of his way to inform us that Thank you, Mark. The the, the grass is green. The field is green. Again, you're not going to find that detail in Matthew or in Luke or in John. But Mark wants you to know that the field is green. Why is that? Well, again, he's relating the memories of Peter, and these are the little vivid details that bear the marks of authentic eyewitness testimony. But I think it's also because, as we saw in verse 34, Mark wants us to see that Jesus is who? The shepherd. And so what echo is Mark picking up on? What image is he insisting has found fulfillment on this Galilean hillside? We read the scripture earlier, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. David's personal shepherd, David's most intimate acquaintance, Yahweh, has appeared on the stage of history in the person of David's promised son, Jesus. And Mark does not want us to miss it. Number one, the shepherd. Number two, the crisis. And third and finally, the feast. Verse 41. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, Jesus gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. Again, just lest we miss it, This is a picture of Jesus as a new Moses providing new manna for the people of God in a new wilderness. But I think it's really interesting and instructive that Jesus does the miracle this way. Jesus, if all he was after was spectacle, creating a spectacle, well, he could have been a lot more efficient. Far be it for me to criticize the miracle worker, but my goodness, why did he deal with the, these middlemen. I mean, wh- why not just say a word and immediately a pile of food appears at the, you know, right in front of every person? 
But no. Jesus decides to work through the disciples, not around them, even though working around them would have meant a lot more efficiency. It's like the mom who lets her three-year-old daughter bake with her. Uh, It's going to take a lot longer, and it's going to create a lot more mess. But efficiency isn't exactly the point. Jesus involves his disciples so they can learn to trust him. And he does the same with us. Well, how does he involve them? Verse 39, it seems he directs them to get the people seated and ready. And then verse 41, he gives them the food to distribute. Now, trust me, I tried this week. It'll make you dizzy if you try to figure out the logistics of this operation, like when exactly the bread and fish were multiplying. But I think this much is probably clear. It's after the blessing, after the prayer, and it's as the disciples move out in faith. Not before. It's as they move out in faith that the bread and fish are multiplied. In other words, what what I think is going on is that they go out from Jesus with this fresh, uh, you know, basket basket or, or, or armful of bread and fish, and they give them to as many people as they can, and then what? What's in their hands now? Nothing. Hands are empty. So they return to Jesus with empty hands only to be filled up again. I think every time they empty their hands and return to Jesus, he fills them up again because they're going back over and over to an inexhaustible source. I mean, the lesson for us is obvious. If you come to Jesus empty-handed, that is humbly acknowledging your own bankruptcy acknowledging that you bring nothing to the equation except for your own personal sin, if you come to Jesus humbly with empty hands, he will fill you up with everything that you need. If you're here and you are not yet a follower of Jesus, this is the most important thing you could understand this morning. The most important thing you could hear and internalize and believe is that your whole life you have been going to other sources for satisfaction, to false shepherds, to things that cannot satisfy you, much less bleed and die and rise for you and save you. But Jesus Christ is the only shepherd who, as Tim Keller has said, if you fail him, will die for you. If you get him, will satisfy you. And if you fail him, will die for you. No other idol, no other shepherd will treat you like that. Everyone else will crush you into the ground. But this Savior has arrived, not just on an ancient Galilean lakeside, but here, in your life, on the shores of your experience. And he offers you to come with empty hands, to turn away from your sin, to come with repentance and faith, and to seek not just a meal to satiate your hunger, but to seek salvation and uh, and satisfaction, and yes, sanctification, but I wasn't planning to say that word. Okay, where am I? Spurgeon describes this open field as, as Christ's banquet hall. I just love that, that image. No doors, no walls, just open and free to anyone who will come. And sure enough, verse 42, look what happens. They all ate and were satisfied. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. This was no light snack to hold them over. Every person on the grass is stuffed and glad. Mark tells us that the 12 apostles pick up 12 basketfuls. It's like they each get one to take home. As, as one person described it, each one gets a faith souvenir to keep forever. The point of the leftovers is that there's always more with Jesus. There's always more with Jesus. Friend, the world will always give you less than what it promises, less than what it seems to offer but Jesus will give you more. 
It doesn't mean he'll always give you what you want. Oh, but Jesus will always give you what you need. Do you have a Mark 6, 42 view of Jesus Christ? They all ate and were satisfied. If you don't, then I would submit that your problem is probably not your view of God's sovereignty. It may be for some of you. My guess is that for most of you, if you're a believer, the reason that you struggle to believe that he really will provide abundantly, far more than you could ask or imagine, isn't because you're not convinced he's sovereign. It's because you're not so sure he sees you and cares for you and is kind to you. But hear me clearly. You can have, if you have a high, soaring view of God's sovereignty, but not a correspondingly high and soaring view of his kindness, you do not have a high view of God. So study his kindness this week. Re-enroll yourself in that course. We thought earlier about going back to school. The course of learning of his kindness Throughout the pages of history, rewinding the tape of your life on all the ways he's been kind to you. And as you do, and by the way, when you meet up with people throughout the week in this church, when you have people into your home, when you have coffee with someone, ask them to tell you the story of God's work in their lives. That's one of the best ways we can get to know one another as brothers and sisters is to ask, what has God done to change your life? And how have you seen him meet all your needs and more. That'll fire our imaginations. It'll fire our faith and our expectation of his kindness and his compassion and his generosity will grow as will our hunger for it. But we need to be careful because I don't know about you, but I have more than once ruined an epic dinner by snacking all day. There's nothing worse than stuffing yourself with Cheetos only to find out that the family's going out for steak or whatever. Well, in the same way, we we can so nibble, as John Piper has observed, we can so nibble from the table of the world that we lose our appetite for the things of God. Well, in conclusion, I, I want you to again know and realize that these stories that Mark is giving us are not disconnected vignettes. They're woven together with a purpose. You guys remember the story we looked at last time? The banquet of Herod. Do you see the contrast? It's a tale of two feasts. A wicked king and a shepherd king. A feast for elites, a feast for for everyone, a feast that leads to death on a platter and a feast that produces life and satisfaction for all. Look again at verse 41. If you're someone who writes in your Bible, I want to encourage you to underline four verbs in verse 41. Taking, that's verb number one. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, Jesus, number two, gave thanks. And number three, broke the loaves. Then he, number four, gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. We've already heard some echoes from the past. This is an echo of the future. Turn to Mark chapter 14. Turn ahead to Mark chapter 14. In verse 22, when Jesus is at the Last Supper with his disciples, I don't think it's coincidental that what he says is an echo of Mark 6.41. In fact, you're going to find those exact same four verbs in Mark 14.22. While they were eating, Jesus, number one, took bread. And when he had, two, given 
thanks. He, three, broke it, and four, gave it to his disciples, saying, take it. This is my body. It's been observed that the world, and particularly the idols that our hearts serve, will, if we give ourselves to them, eventually tear us to pieces. They'll break us down like bread, whether it's a career, a family, a picture-perfect family, a relationship. When we take a good thing and make it into an ultimate thing, it'll enslave us and it'll ultimately crush us. It will demand more from us than we can ever give it. Essentially, in other words, our idols are saying what to us? Your body broken for me. But Jesus comes and he shows up and says, I am the bread of life and it's my body broken for you. We see this echo continue. We don't have time to look at it, but not only in the Last Supper, but also in the Lord's Supper as we take it as a local church on a regular basis. And it'll culminate in the age to come when we will experience the ultimate banquet provided by the ultimate host. And that ultimate host is not just the good shepherd, but the good shepherd who, wonder of wonders, became the lamb slain. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. Revelation 7, the lamb is my shepherd. And the lamb is not just a shepherd, he's the host. Which is why the Apostle John refers to the eternal banquet feast that we have to look forward to as the marriage supper of the lamb. He lived and died and rose and was broken so that we might eat and be satisfied forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you said, you said famously, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. We pray that we would be a church who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, who hungers and thirsts for you, who doesn't settle for things that can only at best try to substitute for what you alone can offer. We praise you, Lord, for your bounty, that we get to distribute it as a church and that we get to also feast on it, world without end. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.